Hi, everybody. Um, so the Lodi Whittier Library welcomed professor, poet, and musician Roger Hecht on October 1st for an in-person reading and workshop. And he has generously offered to also record this video of his reading and presentation. So it's gonna be archived on our library's YouTube channel. And we're very grateful to have this resource um, accessible to our community at any time. Um, so thank you, Roger, and um, thank you to our co-sponsor, Poets and Writers, with public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, with support from the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature. So in this video, Professor Hecht will be reading from his latest chapter book of poetry, Witness Report, from Finishing Line Press, and some of his other works, after which he will lead a short presentation entitled Poetry Lost and Found, making found poetry from forgotten texts. He will be sharing my screen to walk you through some strategies and to expose you to some examples of this form. Um, Roger has also granted us permission to use a few handouts that I will attach to the video's description for your use. So a little background on our guest. Uh, Roger W. Hecht is the author of two collections of poetry, uh, Talking Pictures, um, from Servena Barba Press and a chapbook, Witness Report from Finishing Line Press. These works are available at Amazon and local booksellers, as well as available to borrow from our library. He has also edited two books, The Erie Canal Reader, 1790 to 1950 from Syracuse University Press and Freeman Awake, Rally Songs and Poems from New York's Anti-Rent Movement from Delaware County Historical Association. His poems have appeared or are forthcoming in the Denver Quarterly, Puerto del Sol, Gargoyle, and Redactions, among other magazines. He is an associate professor of English at SUNY Antianta, where he teaches American literature and creative writing. Um, thank you again, Mr. Hecht. Thank you so much, Nora, for inviting me back. I'm really thrilled to be doing this uh, on this Technology, it's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, very, very interesting stuff. So um, I, my lighting, I'm sure, is far from adequate, but uh, we will do our best. So uh, uh, I want to thank you, first of all, uh, Nora and the uh, Lodi Whittier Library for inviting me to read because my book, Witness Report, um, uh, it came out in April of last year just in time for the world to shut down uh, with our global COVID pandemic. And so I never got a chance to have the, uh, the book release reading and, you know, the opportunity to read at libraries and bookstores and various venues to help promote it. So I feel like this is my uh, delayed um, uh, book release party. And so I'm really <laughs> happy to, uh, uh, to be doing this. And the library is a wonderful, wonderful facility. And I really enjoyed reading there uh, back the beginning of October. Um, so I'd like to start off with some uh, some poems from Witness Report from the new collection, as well as some poems from the other collection, Talking Pictures, and uh, also some new poems. Um, we're always writing and always trying to come up with the next book. And um, I'll read some poems too, that will be a sort of a nice segue to the, uh, to the very short uh, talk on found poetry. So this is the title poem, uh, Witness Report. <clears throat> Witness report. You couldn't tell distress in the duck's face, not from the distance we watched it. Maybe in her gait or in the rapid turns of her head with the traffic whizzing past. Certainly the raft of ducklings strung in a line then rushing in behind her showed at the very least confusion. The duck hopped a granite curb the ducklings couldn't leap. It seemed a storybook tragedy was playing out before us. A man tried herding them to the sidewalk, waving off cars that slowed and fortunately didn't wreck. And when the ducks turned back across the road, we knew the resulting mess uh, would form the stories the dozen of us watching helplessly from the gas station pumps might tell our friends that night at dinner or over drinks. 
we're a sentimental town. But all the lights were with them. A woman lifted duckling after duckling from the blacktop to the grass where the duck and, and brood regrouped and could safely wander to their certain deaths sometime off in the future. And so one by one, we all drive off with a great appreciation of just what kind of world we have made. So I suppose it's the poet's obligation to write about a little bit about nature and a little bit about death. Uh, so um, these are all, uh, a lot of these are very Ithaca based poems. Uh, if you know the gas station on Route 13 across from Trader Joe's, you know exactly where those ducks were crossing. Uh, this poem's a villanelle, um, not a terribly interesting title, but it does describe the form. Um, has a more recognizable location, I think. Um, out in Danby, Jen where I used to live, there's a wonderful little pond, Jennings Pond, that's part of the Buttermilk Falls uh, uh, State Park. So it comes from there. Villanelle. <clears throat> the sun sinks past the great beyond, or at least beyond the horizon, and sets aflame the skin of Jennings Pond a red and molten blue reflection stirred only by the misstep of a heron. The sun sinks and beyond deep in the trees, young coyotes hunker till their midnight song sets aflame the skin of Jennings Pond and tears my ears toward that direction. Our cat unwittingly wandered into teeth and terror and the great beyond that summer night their meal, our grief, and so on. The trees turn their heads, now their leaves turn on and set aflame the skin of Jennings Pond, a red and yellow and rust pointillist explosion that draws us to the jaws of their oblivion, our joy and delight till the sun sinks, the great beyond, and all aflame the skin of Jennings Pond. Um, this next poem is uh, derived, I think uh, uh, Garrison Keeler is uh, maybe, may or may not be on people's radars uh, much anymore. Um, <clears throat> it could be a generational thing, I'm sure. People much younger than me probably have no idea who he is. Um, but you re may remember his uh, radio program that he had on Morning Edition, um, uh, the Writer's Almanac, which is still a podcast now, uh, but every day um, he would announce, you know, on this day, so and so, you know, certain literary events may have taken place. Uh, Ulysses was published, or Emily Dickinson was born, and he would um, give us a, a small set of interesting historical literary facts and then read a poem of the day. And, uh, you know, I think. Uh, every poet probably had a dream of being one of Garrison Keillor's chosen ones and get a lot of exposure that way. Although his poems tended to be kind of very Midwestern focused uh, uh, and not necessarily the most avant-garde work, but it was all still very, very well chosen, well curated poetry. So I suppose this is my fantasy of getting a poem on, uh, on Writer's Almanac. I did send this book to Writer's Almanac. They have yet to choose me. It may be because of this poem. It's called, And On This Day. <clears throat> and on this day, I will write a poem Garrison Keeler could read on the radio. Each word formed around the sound of his voice. Lines and pauses aligned to the measure of his Minnesota breath. And let there be S's enough so the whistles through his teeth mirror the wind in the trees where the poem goes. A cabin by a lake in the Adirondacks, perhaps, or the West Virginia hills where your family failed repeatedly to build that summer house. Weekends hacking hopelessly at undergrowth 
that regenerated into impenetrable walls, leaving you with only the vague warmth of a flimsy campfire, hot dogs and tea and a, and a dirty flannel shirt. The kind Keeler might sport on Minnesota mornings, chopping firewood or writing scripts till your parents gave up and bought a condo at the beach. But that doesn't matter because Keeler's warm accent and the soft Americana piano chords envelop you in nostalgia enough to remind you how you don't live here, never did, and where you do live, a ranch or colonial spotting a cul-de-sac somewhere or a cramped city walk-up where street lights and sirens fill the windows all night is a place to escape, a place to seek refuge there among the maples and pines and small stands of birch, the leaf and needle strewn shoreline, the lake's rippled surface reflecting and distorting a darkening sky. Too cold to swim now, so you listen to the night settling in, the birds settling down, not too many insects, not much sunlight left. So you wait for evening's last spotlight to pierce the branches in the kitchen window lined with bottles a century old, dug from trash heaps half a century ago, when you were the sort of exploring boy you always thought you would be easing them from the mud, rinsing them in a creek, saving only the best, bottles with colors they don't make anymore, once filled with mysterious potions they don't make anymore, and the marmalade sunlight filling the kitchen with upended bottle light rainbows makes the cabin a homespun chart filled with promise and youth you promised yourself you would always cling to. That's how you remember it, or how you would remember it if you ever had a cabin, or a cabin that wasn't just a poem in the voice of Garrison Keeler, whistling and whispering through the radio, mixing with the fade in of Americana piano, which tinkles to a stop. Then news from the latest war. It's kind of a grim ending. <laughs> this is a poem. Um, I don't think I read this when I read at the library um, a few weeks ago, but it's very different. It's kind of funny. It's, it's called the ornery orrery. And um, for those of you out there who don't know what an orrery is, it is basically a mechanical model of the solar system um, that were it was very popular in the 18th century. There's all these dramatic paintings of scientists and 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 um, people, you know, studying the orrery under dramatic lights and stuff. So anyhow, it's a it's a it's a mechanic. You know, you turn a crank and the planets turn and spin around the sun. So anyhow, uh, I was watching the television series Borgias and was sort of immersed in the the world of the of the Florentine Renaissance um, and. Michelangelo and Machiavelli and other and Raphael would make cameo appearances. So out of that weird little mix, and also I just love the sound, the ornery orrery. Why wouldn't you write a poem called that? So anyhow, the ornery orrery. Egad, cried Machiavelli. This orrery is stuck. The planets don't align. Now, how will I predict the rise and fall of kings, the comings and goings of plagues, and on which horse God wills me to place my ducats? Leonardo, with an eye toward the mechanical, squinted at the marvelous machine, its wheels and gorgeously engraved discs, its metal spheres perched on sticks. He tried its brass gears, tightened and loosened screws, worried the crank. He recognized the problem at once. Fool, he cried, popping the flat-topped cap off the Florentine's head. Don't you see? This machine can't even exist. We live in a geocentric universe. This heliocentric universe won't be confirmed for 150 years. He relabeled the celestial objects, and the truth came perfectly clear. Besides, 
your dripping candle jammed it here. He flicked a plug of wax with his knife and turned the crank and set the future in motion. The wheels turned freely. Planets spun their orbits. Eclipses came and went. Fruits tumbled from their branches. Princes became obsolete while the sun stayed firmly in place. I see, the master statesman muttered, astounded as his world fell to ruin before his eyes like clockwork. Ooh, history. <laughs> um, let's see, I don't, uh, read just maybe a couple more poems from, from this book and then move on to the other one. So, um, uh, I became very fast, I've been very fascinated with uh, natural processes of decay. I'm not too sure why, but it strikes me as um, just kind of cool that it happens out there. That and the microbiome, you know, uh, give me bacteria and fungi and I'm very happy. Uh, this poem is called uh, Eat and Be Eaten. Eat and be eaten is not a choice. No, oh, uh, excuse me. Eat and be eaten is not a choice. No malice, no ill will, only appetite. The krill, the whale, yours, mine, whatever hunger lingers behind that tree or under the mud. So by all means, raise your empire, watch it crumble, make your money, be kind. Cruelty hinders no one else's hunger. Find beauty in a corpse, a copse of maples dropping leaves by the handful on the surface of a lake, the swell of a breast, curve of an ass, dunk, uh, drunk off another's passion, get lost in the depths of flesh, eat heartily, by all means have lots of kids to love, to feed, and later to be fed to the silent waves of bacteria, to the larval fly. That's, um, let's see, there was another one along those lines. Yes, this is called like scissors. Like scissors, they snip the chemical threads that hold a live thing together. Bacteria, fungus, primordial swarm, then we're gas, then we become element, phosphorus, carbon, something a live plant can claim. Dead, we're soup, we're cheese, we're the meal we're invited to but can never enjoy. Enjoyed, if a mold knows joy. Let's say sated on, fed it because we're feast, the last supper we'll never know because by then we're already being resurrected back into the body of the world. So I like to think of that as a hopeful thought. Um, I'm going to read the last poem from this book. It's, uh, it's called Sky Burial, um, which uh, for those of you not familiar with that term, um, uh, it's Basically, it's 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 dis, it, it's how they dispose of their dead in Tibet. Um, when you're living on the Himalayan plateaus, basically you're living on granite. You can't you know easily dig dig graves. So what they do is uh, uh, you know they take the 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 bodies of the dead to uh, to a ceremonial place and basically leave them for the vultures. So this. The, you know, as the vultures fly away, it's a sky burial. You're taken up into, uh, um, you know, into the next world, um, which in this case happens to be the stomach of a vulture. But I, I like the idea. It seems like, again, the idea of sort of becoming just another part of the world again um, uh, fascinates me. And also the sort of paradoxical term, uh, a sky burial, I found really interesting too. Um, so this is sky burial. If only I could see and smell, could keep my senses as I lose them, wouldn't I find it delicious? The enzymes without me replacing the enzymes within me, replacing cell by cell my body. Such transcendence. 
Patiently, they're waiting the day my defenses diminish, waiting to transfigure. And while I diminish, I will swell like pride with gases, anticipating my higher function. Protein for the cleansing birds. A nest, my hair. My brain case, shelter for a mouse. If I were any other animal, my skin might become shoes, my bones, knives, or needles, or buttons, or combs. It is fitting. Nothing about me wasted. Nothing about me not becoming something else. On that happy note. So um, uh, just a couple of poems from my, uh, my previous collection. Um, Let's see, I haven't actually looked at this in, in a while. Um, well, this seems appropriate. Um, this past weekend, I was uh, fortunate enough to go down to New York City to see this big Jasper Johns retrospective show at the Whitney Museum. I've been a longtime fan of Jasper Johns, um, the post-war American artist. And um, I had actually seen a Jasper Johns retrospective show at the National Gallery in Washington, DC, where I grew up uh, back in the 90s. So, um, so I had written a poem based on, uh, in part, going to that exhibit, but there's a lot of other things going on here too. Um, and it's called Jasper Johns in Reverse. Once a man called the press and threatened to blow up the Washington Monument. Standing, outside, standing beside his illegally parked van, he sweated patiently in his jeans waiting to be shot. Even the president knows by now the value of switching masks more quickly. I know the value of a line. Here's a white building covered with money. Rooms lead to rooms that open onto a room full of doors roped off with red velvet. I'd been walking, I realized, chronologically backwards, having started with abstracted mirrors of corpses and finished with the trace of a painted dot. Numerology enhanced by the width of a line, all for the sake of a good riot. An ideal viewer is a passive receiver with a passion to have an ambition. So why did that guard with bad teeth, angered by men he thought he'd let down, single me out, corner me in the corner of a dim closet of Madonna's and persuade me to drop my pants, stand in the fine electric light and sweat in rivulets? We can be ourselves, he whispered, pressed close to the back of my neck, but only by changing completely our attitudes. It cost me 10 bucks. The faces on the dollars stared back, judging the purchase. Bad deal. Just whose job am I stimulating? Back in the 18th century, in the painting behind me, the clouds have been codified according to texture. Everywhere, the men in suits were measuring the political winds, the fibers in the brush strokes. I think that kind of represents something of my earlier attempts at avant-garde poetry. Um, kind of inspired by J uh, Jasper Johns though, um, I wrote a series of poems and forms. Um, um, I'm teaching, teaching poetry, students want to, uh, you know, they want to learn how to write sonnets sometimes or, or villanelles. And I wasn't really, as a student myself, back in the 1980s, forms were not, um, were not popular. Um, they, it, uh, the, um, the default type of poetry um, was and kind of still is free verse. So, I wasn't put through the uh, through the rigors of um, you know mastering the sonnet and rhyme schemes and stuff like that. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to teach students forms, I better learn how to write them myself. So I decided to try and write in as many different forms as I could. Um, 
but I didn't know what to write about. Um, and this is the problem that Jasper Johns faced because a lot of his early paintings were things like flags and numbers. And it would just be a series of numbers across the canvas. But what was interesting is not the subject matter, but the application of the paint and the textures and the depths that are achieved um, uh, through the kind of techniques he was developing. Um, and he said, uh, I think he said at one point said, you know, I'm just painting what everybody already knows. You know, we know a flag, we don't have to interpret a flag. Uh, what we can do is immerse ourselves in the textures of the pigments. So writing, I decided I'll write sonnets about something people already know. So I wrote about Jack and Jill. Um, so every poem features Jack and Jill, or at least the words Jack and Jill. Um, and I wrote sonnets, pantoums, villanelles, sestinas, uh, prose poems, haiku, you know, the works. Um, and some of them turned out to be pretty interesting. So, so this section of the book is called J and J. Uh, and it begins with an, with an uh, uh, epigraph from Jasper Johns. Take an object, do something to it, do something else to it, which was uh, taken from one of his uh, notebooks. So these are a series of haiku. There are no individual titles. I guess they're all individually titled J and J. Um, at noon, the well barely throws shadows. No breeze wrinkles the water. New sounds startle crow. Heavy breaths bending grass. Two sets of footsteps. No one knows what made Jack swoon. We only know that he felt a great thirst. Jack felt his head then water in the grass, sunlight on a broken pail. When Jack fell, Jill sat tight. Swelling with pity, she pitched herself forward. For some reason, all of these poems seem to imply a kind of a sexual content. Uh, something about the Jack and Jill story lends itself to that. Um, one of the things that I, one of the interesting forms is called a um, abecedarian, where um, you write the poem in the order, like the first letter of each word follows the order of the alphabet. So the first word has an A, starts with A, the second word starts with B, the third word starts with C. So it's an interesting puzzle to try and write these words in alphabetical order um, and still kind of make sense, or if not make clear sense, imply a sense. Um, and just to give myself an extra headache, I reversed the order of the alphabet. And so instead of writing a 26 word poem, I wrote a 52 word poem. Um, so it's, I, it's, you could call it a double reverse abecedarian. A breathless clarity decided everything. Fog gone, heavenly images. Jack, ki Jack kicked lumped mud neatly over, past quickened roots, stems. The trees' undervalued visions were wasted. Xeroxed yellow, zilch, zeroed out. Yet xenon whitened vowels undid that stalwart rocky qualm. Perhaps other natured might license kindness. Jill's irreducible hermetic gravity finessing Eros's discernible claim, beauty's architect. Um, and I think what I'll do is just sort of end it with the Sestina, which has always been something of a crowd pleaser. Um, the Sestina is an interesting form because um, it is a poem written in six line stanzas. And the last, but each stanza 
uses the same ending words. So you choose six words that are the last word of each line. So in this case, the words are Jack, Jill, water, fetch, tumble. Um, yeah, Jack, Jill, water, hill, fetch, and tumble. Yeah. But then the order of the words changes in each stanza. So the like the first word becomes the second word in the next stanza, the second word becomes the fourth word, the third word becomes the sixth word. So there's a very predict, it's like turning a, a gear, um, uh, you know, so the, 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 uh, the words change in a very specific order each time. Um, so the challenge is to write a line to the word <laughs> and, and still have it make kind of sense. So, so it, it, it's a fun form. It's, uh, uh, it can be a blast to write. So this is a Jack and Jill Sestina. Oh, the other thing is you do that through six stanzas and then the last stanza is three lines long, uh, but you still have to use all those six words. So it's the last stanza kind of wraps everything up. Although he put no stock in coincidence, often Jack felt larger powers at work. Take Jill, for instance. Why did she complain of thirst when water was clearly at hand? Why, when they were at the hill, did Jill feel urged to give voice to her need? <clears throat> Fetch. Jack felt like a dog, but a good dog, and he complied. Tumble up the hill and back. He just might get a tumble, she thinks, as she eyes the thighs of Jack stride bravely against gravity a few inches higher, fetching, though she's though he's somewhat a help, he is a somewhat homely lad. And while Jill entertained her dirty thoughts, Jack picked his way downhill, then on one knee, presented with a flourish, the water. What followed followed the force of the elemental. Water, earth, the burning sun, and blood, and the blood hotter still. Did he tumble onto her, or was it she onto him when they crashed to the hillside, doused with their own doing? The bucket burst, and Jack furiously flung his wet clothes off. Or was it Jill, drenched, who first stood naked? They had to fetch their wet clothes quickly so that Jack could fetch a condom. What followed after is now water under the bridge. Second thoughts were Jill's second nature, and a kind of terror began to tumble through her mind. Who the hell is this boy Jack, anyway? What made me think he's worth a hill of beans in the first place? This is one hell of a mess. I mean, me, that boy, it's so far-fetched I could retch. Nearby, smiling Jack, not a little surprised at his good fortune, began to water his own ego, not suspecting he could tumble from his peak at any minute. He whispered, Jill, into her neck, wanting to be tender. This snapped Jill out of her reverie of doom. She felt the sunlight felt the hill, felt the drying sweat on her skin. She felt her terror tumble away and felt her power returning. Turning, she said, fetch, and the boy at once knew his place and task, water. Before he fell too far, she called again, Jack. She really didn't want to toss water on his fire. Jack, Jill said, that was nice. The words, excuse me, the words at first were hard to fetch, though when they did, they tumbled down her, they tumbled from her lips like children down a hill. It takes a nice turn, I think. Anyhow, so those are a nice, some fun things that I've, that I've done in the other book. Um, I thought I would read just maybe two or three new poems and then segue into the found poetry thing. Um, so um, this is a, some of these, I'm like kind of excited to say some of these poems just got picked up by magazines. So, so um, you can find them in a literary website near you. This is called Snake Plant. And I don't know if, if you know, snake plants are those wide green spiky things, apparently they're impossible to kill. Um, um, uh, so, so anyhow, 
uh, you find them in any grocery store <laughs> flower section. Snake plant. That potted snake plant looks nothing like a snake. It's a flat, wide ribbon that ends in a point. Maybe a snake flattened by traffic on some desert road, but no snake I know stands head first in the dirt like a signpost, though I've seen them slip quickly down a hole between two rocks in my garden. And no snake I know of is so cardboard stiff or pale green or white rimmed, though I've seen ribbon snakes dark green with yellow racing stripes. And wouldn't it be cool to see a snake in a helmet and goggles buckled into a Formula One, tongue flick for a thumbs up, tear around the track, because snakes are fast, a wrinkle in the grass, though they freeze when cautious. The snake that bit my daughter's foot stuck around, stood its ground long enough for a cell phone selfie annoyed to be almost stepped on, which is how they eventually determined it wasn't a rattler. Though I didn't know that at the time, racing half across Pennsylvania in the pre-dawn night, um, no, racing across half of Pennsylvania in the pre-dawn night with only the best case scenario I could think of, she'll only lose her foot, which had inflated to almost twice its size each hour's swelling marked with a paramedic sharpie, a topo map of toxins. But it was a copperhead's bite, so that was the worst of it. And by the time I arrived at the hospital, the antivenom freshly flown in from the zoo had begun to call the swell. So hooray for modern medicine and for hospitals that write off exotic expenses and for the taxpayers that absorb the cost and for the snake that gave my daughter a reputation for toughness she carried the rest of the school year and a story that's good for a lifetime. That snake that lay like a ribbon in the rocky shadows, though nothing like a snake plant, which looks more like green lasagna when you think about it. I kind of like the little twist at the end. Um, I've been writing a lot of sonnets lately. I'm not too sure why. Sonnets are making an interesting comeback. Um, I think because of their compactness, um, you know, you try and have that punch at the end. Uh, so, so, and again, it's an interesting challenge. Um, although I will admit I'm not terribly attentive to rhyme. I think sonnets are, are the definition of sonnets have become a little bit loose. This is, I guess, uh, my response to the current situation. Um, I don't have a real good title for it right now. It's called Plague Sonnet. It begins with an epigraph from The Cure. I'm alive, I'm dead. A tiny circuit in search of an opportunity, spiked meatball on the tip of a tip of a needle no angel would dare dance on. Interspecies hobo hopping droplet after droplet, emerging from the forest, leaking with punctures, consequence of a collision where threads intersected, then bam, a new being born of an overwritten code, written over and over, that never hungers, never feeds, instead only purging, purging, purging the ultimate printer pushing graffiti through the membrane wall, a sign, specter, one possible future of the million future variant futures, purgations, cuppings and bloodlettings, mass graves, always different, always the same, ancient as, as all get out and always brand spanking new. It's my image of a virus. <laughs> Um, and then I'll, one more sonnet, and then I'll do the sort of transition to the found poems. This is called The Ghosts of the Future. The ghosts of the future are walking among us, picking fruit in the produce aisle, honking annoyingly the second the light turns green, haunting the back rows of bookstores searching for forgotten words or they haven't arrived yet, 
burrowed in a belly full of fluid, just a bubble becoming a solid. Or they are halves not yet whole, two genetic threads to be spewed out of some other ghost bodies, spilling, then mingling, then doubling, doubling, doubling. Then the troubling torment that follows, the falling out into this world between those bookends, birth, then death. It may come quickly, but let's hope it's delayed, extended very far off into some distant time, so they'll have good stories to tell because we want our, all of our ghosts to have good stories to tell. Um, so the talk I'm going to give is, or you know, the, the workshop I gave and, the, uh, and we'll be doing sort of the, the talk part of that has to do with found poetry. And found poetry, I think is a really cool form because you're not trying to come up with words yourself. You're trying to make words or make use of words that are already pre-existing. I mean, nobody owns their own words, um, but rather than trying to struggle to imagine them or come up with them, you're, you're puzzling out me possible meanings um, with, with the words that are presented to you. And so it's kind of modern found poetry comes out of the Dadaist movement you know, the idea of, of, of making collages out of trash picked things, bicycle seats and, and handles Picasso used to make a bull's head uh, sculpture, or even the toilet that Duchamp, the urinal that Duchamp put on it, turned upside down and declared it a fountain and, uh, and put it in an art museum. Uh, some found art like that can be provocative and some of it is just really really interesting and so i've been doing found art um, um, for a number of years i think my first foray into it um, was something that i did in graduate school um, when i was doing my mfa in poetry and you know graduate students were all ambitious and sending our poems out to magazines. And this is back in the day of snail mail. So you stick it in an envelope and wait three months. And then it comes back in an envelope with your poems and a rejection letter. And uh, for some strange reason, I, just, I was just taping all of my rejection letters to my refrigerator. Um, I thought it was motivation. My friends thought I was sick um, and thought it was a very unhealthy thing to do. And um, <clears throat> um, uh, begged me to throw them away. And finally, I, I, you know, said, all right, I'll get rid of them. I'm tired of hearing this from people who come over to my house, but I was going to decide I had to make something of them. So I literally, I cut them up and put the, put phrases and words into a hat and pulled them out of the hat and constructed a poem which was immediately accepted the first place or first magazine I sent it to. Um, so it's called Communicant. So these again, these are all um, literary magazine phrases from literary magazine rejection letters, and they all have a similar, often you know, sim similar language, similar phrasing. You know, they're trying to get it, get the pain over with very quickly, but also be. Uh, gentle or kind, perhaps. So communicant. Dear Sorry, thank you for sending, and we feel luck with your work. The editors encourage you to try your interest, but please try again. We have been overwhelmed, but your patience does not fit. We offer the regret that we offer and receive too many manuscripts sending implicit criticism of our editorial needs. Your circumstances invite you sending it carefully. Our current needs regret that circumstances are unable to use it at this time. We have received it elsewhere. We regret that we regret, however. We are unable from being able, but may mean simply, please try some reading. Sincerely, sir. <laughs> so that was my, my vengeance. Um, so a more recent iteration of this is um, I decided as an interesting text to use 
found text is record album liner notes. So, you know, actually vinyl is making a comeback. So you can find these things now. But back in the day, the back of a record jacket um, uh, could have uh, some very interesting text on it. Sometimes it might be, especially on jazz, jazz albums, a pretty sophisticated essay about the music and the musicians and its relationship to the larger jazz world. Sometimes they're just like advertising stuff, you know, um, uh, but here's the latest sound from blah, blah, blah. And, but they're all kind of interesting. And I thought it would be an, again, an interesting challenge to use that language and try and recast it into a poem. But, uh, but as with the double reverse abecedarian, I had to put an additional hitch into it. So all of these poems are acrostics. And an acrostic is where the first letter of each line spells out a word. So uh, you might find, you know, uh, uh, you know, elementary school projects. You know, you you make a poem out of the word mother. You know, uh, or you make a poem out of the word, you know, Valentine. You make a Valentine's poem. Uh, so my acrostic is the title of the album and the name of the artist. So this first poem is. Um, uh, the acrostic is out to lunch, um, uh, uh, and I think that's yeah. Um, uh, why? Oh, uh, Eric Dolphy. <laughs> it's like blanking. Who did that album? And I'm reading the acrostic to find out. So it's Eric Dolphy's album, Out to Lunch. So it's Out to Lunch, Eric Dolphy. That's the acrostic written down the, down the page. And so all of these words, like they don't necessarily make grammatical sense. I hope they make a kind of poetic or spiritual or artistic sense. Once struck, consider the immediate unmentionable somewhere else. Time plays pulse. Gases trumpet soul sense, often impenetrably abstract. Little seems intact in the unison of fragments, no matter the incredible, capable as an instrument. He's in and suddenly in pieces, every time at the same time. Reasons invoke responses is what he says, different, way, different kinds of ways. Chime some lucid sounds in a different context, an incredible range of men appear in sequence-like effect muscularly individual, playing phrases rapidly. Freedom hangs in the air. This country puts you down for it. And um, this next one, um, uh, I gave it a title. The titles that I gave the poems were often just the title of one of the songs uh, in the album. The acrostic tells us that the album is Discrete Music by Brian Eno. So it's Discrete Music Eno. Dabbling with discipline, the long delay, I gravitated toward duration, predictable change. She visited with the spirit, coupled with the pitch of my pleasure, recording unashamedly my erato. I used to be only recall, an echo of future utility. I realized the translation failed. I was not mingled with the sound of the rain. I was set up having laid down stiff and static, an accident in a bed of knives and forks, ignored, confined to the ambience, but not the environment. The ardor suggested a new way of hearing light, one channel charmingly so. So I'll let the world decide what any of those poems mean. Um, I'm going to kind of switch gears now because I'm talking, you know, giving you some examples of found poetry and what you can do uh, to um, illustrate with other people's works and define the different types of found poems. We did this uh, we had a uh, when we met at the library uh, at the beginning of the month. 
uh, we actually did a workshop where uh, all the participants got a chance to make their own found poems. And so I hope this will give everybody uh, the inspiration to try this on their own and see what they can come up with. So I am sharing the screen and la voila, we've got my, uh, my PowerPoint. So this uh, is called Poetry Lost and Found. So found poetry, it's a way of composing poems using language found in everyday life. Uh, it doesn't rely on a poet's own story and biography. I think a, an impediment maybe to some people wanting to write poetry is the sense that they haven't had enough crazy, wild, or highly traumatic experiences to draw from. Um, but And this is a way of making poems where it's not your experience that matters, although it is because your experience forms your own sensibility and attitude and everything. But the poem emerges from the sensibility of the poet who chooses the words and puts them together and creates the new meanings that again are, can't be predicted. They're, they're, uh, they could be very surprising. So one of the earliest forms of found poetry is actually is called a cento and it actually has its um, origins in fourth century Rome. Uh, the poet, Roman poet Asonius uh, made, uh, basically uh, took lines from the poet Virgil and lines that he, from different poems and constructed a new poem assembling these. It's kind of like the first mixtape, I suppose, um, assembling the lines he liked, ostensibly because it was an homage to, uh, to Virgil. Um, uh, but it sort of opens the door for creating poems out of the lines of other people's poems. And so long as you acknowledge your sources, it's not plagiarism. So, and I, 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 I realize I actually used this uh, PowerPoint in my uh, poetry workshop at SUNY Oneonta yesterday. And I looked at it and I thought, I forgot to put the name of the poet up here, uh, but it's actually in the packet in the handout. So, so my sources are there. So uh, as you can see at the bottom here, I don't know if my little cursor is showing up, but we can see um, uh, who she took uh, her work from. And some of them are links to the specific poems that, that she actually used. Wolf Cento, very quick, very intense, like a wolf at a live heart, the sun breaks down. What is important is to avoid the time allotted for disavowals as the livid wound leaves a trace, leaves an abscess, takes its contraction for those clouds that dip in thunder, dip thunder and vanish like rose leaves in closed jars. Age approaches slowly, but it cannot crystal bone into thin air. The small hours open their wounds for me. This is a woman's confession. I keep this wolf because the wilderness gave it to me. There's so many interesting um, implications, I guess. I mean, I really love the, the line, um, um, you know, the clouds dip thunder and vanish like rose leaves in closed jars. I mean, there's a beautiful image and how do you, you know, it's just an enormous leap that one has to make in order to kind of combine those, uh, those two images. Um, I can't explain what it means, but it does mean something. And I love the sort of uh, the surprising suggestiveness when you put these random lines together. Um, and of course the mind has to do something with it. And, uh, and it, it's very suggestive. So that's the Cento. So um, cut up collage poetry um, is, is another type of found poem. Uh, it was uh, uh, developed by the Dada artists uh, around the time of uh, the years of and just after World War I. Um, Dada poetry and art was really meant to be provocative. Um, in part because they were challenging 
the institutionalization of art. And so they produce what, you know, would, would have been considered at the time anti-art to challenge art's meanings and its, and its primacy, especially in relationship to power, you know, the, the institutions who display their power by the art they collect uh, and the art they commission. And so the Dadaists would cut up magazines, newspapers, catalogs, uh, ads, uh, found flyers on the ground, subway tickets and stuff, and, and, and pastiche them together and produce some very interesting visual collages like the one on the right, but also um, um, making poems out of that. So this is a poem by Tristan Zara. Um, uh, it's in the French. Um, I believe, I wanna say that the illustration is by Max Ernst, but I might be wrong about that. Um, uh, however, I have the poem, the translation of the poem in English, um, assessment, voltaic art of these two nerves that don't touch near the heart. We know the black, we note the black shivers under the lens. In this feeling, this white spouting and methodical love splits my body into rays. Toothpaste pastry, transatlantic tickets, the crowds crash the column crouched in wind, range of rockets on my head, the bloody revenge of the liberated two-step, directory of determinations at prefix, folly at 3.20 a.m. or five, five francs 50. Cocaine slowly gnaws the walls for its pleasure. Satanic horoscope dilates under your vigor. Virgil's vigilance verifies the viral wind. Uh, and I cannot read the small print there. I'm sorry about that. Um, but, you know, what's interesting, you know, it's spread out on the page in an interesting visual way. You can see uh, by the different fonts that they're using, they're trying to indicate the different sources that these may have come up with, uh, 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 that they may have taken these words and these phrases from. But I found this, this is Tristan Zara's instructions, how to make a Dadaist poem. And you can kind of see it played out in this example. Take a newspaper, take a pair of scissors, choose an article as long as you are planning to make your poem, cut out the article, then cut out the words that make up the article, put them in the bag, shake it gently. I like that, gently, not vigorously. Um, then take out the scraps one after the other in the order in which they left the bag, copy conscientiously, the poem will be like you. <laughs> um, and now you are officially a Dadaist writer if you, if you follow those steps. Um, so another type of found poetry is erasure and blackout poetry. And uh, I think this is people, th this is pretty popular and there's actually a whole bunch of websites that you can do this um, uh, where you can actually, they'll give you a text and you can black things out. But you take a pre-existing text and then you isolate words or combinations of words in order to kind of discover the hidden meaning within the story. Um, so this is actually, um, Isabel O'Hare um, took a letter that was written by pastors um, declaring their support for Roy Moore, who was uh, a judge in Alabama who became pretty famous nationally for his uh, putting the Ten Commandments in uh, uh, basically defying the idea of the separation of church and state and putting the Ten Commandments in his court uh, courtroom. Um, and when he had to remove them from the actual courtroom, he paid to have a giant granite statue or of the Ten Commandments put in front of the courthouse. Um, and he later uh, ran for Senate uh, unsuccessfully, uh, but he also has uh, uh, was charged with uh, with sexual assault. Uh, so these this is a letter written by conservative uh, clergymen uh, defending him. 
And this is Isabel O'Hare's blackout sort of deconstruction of their letter. Dear friends and fellow Alabamians, for decades, Roy Moore uh, has taken faith and justice from women. You can know a man by his friends. They know God's word as war. We are ready to send a bold message. Dishonesty, fear, and immorality are our convictions, our savior. So kind of not what they intended, certainly, but it's the hidden message that Isabel O'Hara found. Um, I have a few other examples of, of this type of found poetry in this case, and I regret not including the name of the artist here, um, uh, took Milton's poem uh, Lycidas and isolated words and phrases to kind of create a poem within the poem. Um, here, the artist uh, uses colored pencil in a kind of ombre effect, I guess, uh, to decorate the page. Um, and you can see on the one in the left, they sort of had lines to connect words as they go down the page. Um, Las, laurel and myrtle, rude, compel me to sing. Sisters, that spring vain and coy. Uh, together, both the high lawns appeared, both together with the fresh dews of night. Heavens sloping danced wild and wild joyous flowers. So kind of an interesting image to extract from the much longer poem. Um, there's a number of artists who do different strategies to cover over the text. In this case, uh, Jen Bourbon literally uses a needle and thread to obscure the words that she is blacking out um, to, again, kind of make a statement about the nature of art and art history. Um, painters for years have been trying to put it upon canvas. Men like Corot have told us again and again that clearly delineated forms kill the picture. The great get on with the least possible and suggest everything by light. Kind of an interesting condensation of the artistic statement. Um, and Beautiful Leech by Carrie Arizona. She's using a page from Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra. <laughs> and she has this lovely way of these sort of blobby forms connecting the letters and in some cases punctuation um, to create a sentence or a poem out of Nietzsche's prose. Whoever you may be, be as blood flowing to bleeding answer. I am a wound who lives on blood like a beautiful leech. I love that one. I guess that's kind of leech-like forms that she's using to, uh, to bind the words. Um, there's a really interesting artist named Tom Phillips. He's a member of the Royal Academy um, who developed a project called a Humament where he picked up a, um, just randomly found a book at a bookstall in London uh, called A Human Document. It's an Edwardian novel. He said it wasn't very good, <laughs> uh, but he didn't really care about the original novel. What he did was he did the, you know, kind of treated uh, uh, erasure poetry, sort of found what he thought was the hidden narrative within the narrative and kind of created a character named Toge, which took the letter, the four letters from together or sometimes he might have those four letters spread across the page linked to create Toge as this sort of artist in search of meaning and in search of art. Um, and you can see, of course, hints of the text um, behind the artwork, but amazing, beautiful artwork to cover over the pages. Uh, Toge doing Italy, the purple pilgrimage, he found the Renaissance great marble prayer, the moving marble, the cathedral emotions. 
you can, if you look up Tom Phillips Ahumamit, you can find his, his you know, uh, professional webpage where he produces all of the pages from Ahumamit. And you can actually, you can buy the book on, you know, from uh, have your local bookstore order it, um, uh, Odyssey Books or Buffalo Street Books, um, or you can um, find it from bookstore.com. Um, you can buy the book or you can go to his website to see all the, uh, all the individual pages. He's actually done several different versions of it. So he did his original Humament and he keeps on adding pages or changing pages and revising pages. So the story keeps on changing as does the artwork. It's fabulous stuff. Um, another poet, Mary Royful, does something similar. She mostly uses whiteout to um, um, uh, uh, cover her pages, but she will add additional artwork and or collages, um, uh, doodles and things to, to illustrate it. But she, again, like Tom Phillips, found, um, I think it's like a turn of the century, um, 1890s, 1910 children's book called Melody. And ex again, with through the erasure technique, extracts really interesting meaning. Um, I, I, uh, the book is long. I found a, a page Again, this is online too. If you do, if you if you Google Mary Royful Melody, you will find this uh, uh, her whole book uh, on a web, on on a literary journal's web, uh, website. Um, uh, so is um, it isn't the first time I've had four parts of a mind. What a great kind of Orphic statement. Good morning. Shoot me because. I am a pernicious example of searching. Wow. <laughs> so, and, and just sort of my last example of found poetry is, I think this is a, an accurate um, characterization is Dr. Seuss's Cat in the Hat, where he was, um, you know, asked to write a new kind of children's book because Prior to the cat in the hat, pretty much every school kid was reading Dick and Jane, um, which aren't, don't exactly have compelling narratives um, and were boring kids to death and not exactly helping them read. So he was given this list of 236 words, um, mostly one syllable words, because they thought these were the words that uh, young children would most easily be able to sound out and make sense of. Um, it took him almost two years to write the cat in the hat because when you're the uh, the story of uh, uh, of cat in the hat just doesn't come to you, <laughs> uh, and when you've got this very limited um, uh, vocabulary to work with, but once he kind of figured out what kind of story he wanted to tell, I think the writing of it came relatively quickly. But I think you know. If this is all you, obviously he could use those 236 words many times. He wasn't limited to one use uh, or one time use of them, but it's, uh, yeah, here are your found words. Now write a classic children's book from it. That's the challenge. Um, so that's the, I'm going to stop the share here. Um, so that's a, I hope an interesting introduction to found poetry and gives you some ideas for what you might want to do yourself. Go grab a, get, grab a magazine and a scissors and a glue stick and have a lot of fun. I want to thank you, Nora, for inviting me to come and do this, uh, this little video. Oh my gosh, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming back and doing this encore for us. Um, anybody who wants to make some found poetry and send us pictures, um, you can email it to youth at lodilibrary.net. I would love to see what you produced. And if you enjoyed this and you're interested in more, you know, events and programs having to do with the literary arts, um, keep track of our website at lodilibrary.net. Um, there's always stuff going on. On November 6th, we're going to have David Foreman here. He's going to talk about Jewish folk tales and family stories and um, do a few uh, selections from his translation of Solomon Simon's The Clever Little Tailor. 
um, and talk about how to preserve your family stories as an artifact. So that's pretty exciting when the holidays are coming up and you're going to be seeing your family members, right? <laughs> so Time to um, interrogate them. <laughs> <laughs> right. How to get all the information and make it interesting for generations and generations. <laughs> it's a pretty meaty topic. Um, so thank you again, Roger. And um, after I stop the recording, stick around because I want to ask you a few questions. But... Sure, sure. Well, it's my pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me back. Sure. Bye, everybody.